Um, well, Michael, congratulations to you and to Kieran. What a beautiful film. Thank you. Um, and just to um, uh, kind of give a brief background, both yourself and Kieran go by the name Complete Control Films. Yeah. Uh, this um, you were formed in 2009, and around then, um, and uh, you've made several documentaries. But maybe you'd begin by telling me a little bit about what inspired you to make this film and what's different about it from your point of view. The printer? Yeah. Um, in 2010, when we started started making documentaries, and it was, it was the first time as well, so, um, you know, it's very difficult just to say, OK, I'm going to start making a documentary. I mean, difficult because afterwards you realise how difficult it actually is to do, to do it properly. Um, but having made Town All the Time and Another Way Home um, in 2012, I think it gave us, a, gave Karen and I a bit of confidence to look at other things. And one of the things that we thought about was um, old shops around Ireland. There's quite a few of these places. I think Billy's, Billy's place is particularly unique anywhere mm -hmm. in the country, but there are some what are beautiful um, places, I think, that are um, on the cusp of passing away, I suppose. And uh, we thought about maybe, you know, if we filmed a few and put them together, and then we just let it go because we got very busy <laughs> with other other stuff. And I was, I was working on a book as well at the time, and then uh, we got into the Red Barn documentary. And then Karen suggested, you know, Billy Field again. And uh, we went down and asked Billy. But the reason we did this is because I think this is like documentaries usually have a reputation or or cultural memory demands that documentaries are kind of you know there's a revelation or there's a narrative or there's uh, statistics or something factual or something educational or informative or instructive and just thought it'd be great to do one does hasn't it doesn't have any of those elements yeah because um, the other two documentaries so it was cinematic yeah mm, so the other this, two, this was cinematic for okay. us yeah so the other two documentaries really were more current affairs and here well, was something well, that Tunnel time was like an essay really it was like a, it was like a kind of a, a sociological essay um you know about bad planning and job losses and the donut effect and stuff like that mm. uh, another way home then was a real Really, really tough documentary, and um, about Schliella and you know mental health. And I wouldn't urge anybody to take on mental health because it's just so varied and so large well, and so might, deep. But we might return to those in a minute. Yeah. But uh, clearly, the printer is a very different kind of a film. Yeah, because I, I, I don't know about Karen. I don't want to speak from, but I was exhausted after all the way home in terms of you know trying to get a message across, and I'm not even sure if we did the job properly. And I know a lot of people were affected by it, but just wanted to kind of escape all of that, and uh, this looked like the ideal place to find something quiet and lots of space, film space. What I mean by space now is um, you're not being hit over the head all the time uh, with a message, or you're not being hit over the head all the time by uh, emotionally. So when I when I mean space, I mean film space, time to just uh, observe and look and feel whatever you want to feel. There's very much a sense of that from the film. It's quite a slow pace to it. Yeah. Was that deliberate? That was very deliberate, yeah. Um, actually, it was even slower. Uh, Karen will attest to this. It was even slower to begin with. Um, so, uh, and some of the feedback was that it was, you know, maybe too slow. Um, actually, uh, it set out to make a silent film to begin with. Black and white silent film was, felt a little bit like a cliche. And then when we took the pictures, um, and Billy allowed us into the print room, and we took 290 photos, or Karen took 290 photographs, um, the colours looked beautiful, mm. and black and white wouldn't have done it justice. And you know, um, Kieran is the cinematographer here, yeah. and uh, and you're the writer and director. Really, that's how you both work. Yeah. Kieran's more the technical man, as it were. Yeah, not even sure for writer director of proper terms, but uh, you know, in, in, it's in, close in, enough. Yeah, in letting people know what you do, I suppose they're they're the yeah. best terms. But and tell me, kind of uh, loose, really. Tell me a little bit about how you shot the film, a little bit about the equipment, and just for the you know the film buffs. Um, Kieran uses a is, is it a Canon, Kieran? Yeah, so Kieran is a Canon, but it's not a video camera. It's it's a 
It's a camera camera. It's a digital yeah, digital camera, graphic yeah. camera. Yeah. But it, it, it's 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 beautiful for portrait work. That's mm. it, that's really its ticket, and it, it particularly for interviews actually. Uh, but Kieran uses a number of lenses in those wide lens and um, portrait lens, and there's a very very good lens which goes right intimate into detail, which you know focuses out. We'll say the peripheral vision and brings little details out. So. Um, and you shot this in natural light. You didn't use uh, much. Art. Most of it was natural light. Yeah, um, the scenes inside the shop there. I just, I just thought they were gold because you had all that that yellow aspect going on, and then traffic was passing outside. And Karen, remember this it was a sunny day, and we were getting all this reflection inside in the shop. And we, most of the time, we were gasping when we were taking this because we were kind of. A lot of filmmakers think that your equipment has to be just amazing and your lighting has to be amazing. But if you know, if you if you go back in time, if you if you wind back the clock and kind of think all composition, um, you know, back to before photography or film or anything like that, just even before art, your 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 naked eye composition is the best thing to go by, and everything in there just looked fantastic in so, the naked eye. Right. And so this was why you decided in the end black and white wouldn't do it justice, actually. Yeah, yeah, because, I don't know, maybe we were just being a bit pretentious thinking about black and white, really, to be honest. Yeah. Okay. Um, your background, Michael, is you're a journalist, originally. Yeah. yeah. And um, there must have been a, a kind of a journalistic bit of you that uh, that came out during the making of the yeah. film. Unfortunately, why do you say unfortunately? Because jur journalism is, is all about angles and agendas and polemics, and the older I get, the less I like it. Um, so you wanted a rest from all that? Yeah, and another way home was all journalism, and town at a time was just like sick with journalism in it. So, um, can we talk about town at a time for a minute? Because that was a very—I think anybody from y'all that would be in the audience will remember that film. It was a very courageous film to make at the time, particularly for two local lads. Yeah in as much as that it was a film that highlighted and called out really decades of incompetence and bad planning. Um, mm -hmm. And I think you mentioned to me when we were chatting about this last time uh, that, that what outraged you the most was that this was happening during the boom. Yeah, uh, as a film, it's got a lot of problems, you know, because technically we, we were raw. Um, it's got a lot of problems that when I'd love to go back and remake it again, but I'm not going to because we're just too busy with other stuff. But uh, as an essay, yeah, as a sociological essay, it's very strong, yeah, because it hammers home some, you know, truths at the time that people were talking about at bus stops and in supermarkets and stuff and anecdotal evidence you'd pick up listening to people and I had been working as a journalist for five years going to council meetings which is quite a, quite Fun. a cross to bear um, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I, I wasn't getting paid for that suffering uh, properly enough um, but yeah as a sociological essay it was strong um, and there was there was uh, quite a reaction to it yeah and primetime actually wanted to do primetime wanted to do a piece on it and uh which was interesting because they had seen they had seen the trailer on on youtube mm. uh, and the irish times covered it uh carla brown the irish times did a series of things about about irish town suffering and town of the time actually was the template for that for that series um so when it was covering the irish times um yeah it, it, the film in the Walter Alley, yeah, that was effective. But once it was in this, the Irish Times, that was kind of like, oh no, everybody knows our dirty secrets Okay, so now. just to explain, <laughs> it was it was screened at the Walter Alley. It was premiered, if you like, yeah, for yeah. the townspeople. What yeah, was the it's reaction? only public screening, yeah. What was the reaction to it? Uh, it was like a boil had been burst and people were kind of, you know, paining, but at the same time full of relief. And it was like, okay, we've said it now, it's out. And because it's in film, this is the thing about film, I'd been writing about this in journalism for, for five years and nobody, I don't know if anybody was even reading it, but suddenly when you make something in film, it's like everybody can, you know, it, it does a completely different reaction. It's like it's out there, people can see it because film is so subjective. It's the most subjective of all the arts uh, because it's so populist as well as artistic. It's, it's just bridges, it just bridges that gap beautifully. And therefore, everybody has an opinion on it. And because it's so visual and so so immediate, um, 
that's why it was so effective. It was a film that highlighted the decline of the town in terms yeah. of, you know, uh, the streets, the shops being empty. Yeah. And uh, I'm just trying to relate it back to just the difference between that experience and the experience of going into Bill's be beautiful and very well preserved shop. I mean, it really hasn't modernized. Uh, I did an interview uh, recently about the printer, um, and I, I hadn't thought about this, but the same conversation about town all the time and then the printer, and the interviewer said to me, he said, um, with all the industry that's left you all, he said, this really is a, this is really a story about the ability to um, sustain yourself uh, in praise of Bill, the fact that all the other industries have closed and he's still working away. Uh, and I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, I think that's very true. Because it's still in business. Bill is it's still, still in He's the, still in business, and yeah. he's still and, printing. Yeah, and it's, you know, when you think of all the manufacturing and all the artisan work that's gone, um, you, ha you really do have to praise his, his ability to sustain that mm -hmm. business, yeah. Do you think in some, way, in some ways Bill symbolises the town? I do because um, I, I, that's the first time I've, I've heard that now and my immediate reaction is to say I do but maybe later on I might think it, it doesn't but right now I think it does because... That's a very political answer, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, think, I think it does because I suppose in some ways the shop represents um, shop represents Yol's reputation around the country as this kind of Victorian industrial beach town yeah mm. yeah it's a town really like that, that, yeah. that came into its own in 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 the industrial uh, when in Ireland yeah well all, all towns have cyclical history booms and mm. uh, you know peaks and troughs but Yol's cyclical history uh, and its industrial history goes right back to you know the 1600s um, but yeah it's most recent Victorian and later on 1950s industri industry Boom. Um, but Bill has, Bill's shop has outlasted all of that. And of course, we, we see it now, and even, you know, for our age group, we remember it as, as, uh, as a particular type of place. But Fields Printers was actually a, a big employer at one stage, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think Bill said there was, there could have been up to 30 billion, I can't remember. Would that be right? About 20 or 30 people employed? Not that many? Handful, or oh, four or five. Okay, I couldn't remember. I couldn't remember the number, but okay. yeah. But it, it, it did employ people in town, yeah, and you know, mm. for years. Tell me, um, the exhibition and uh, the the run over the six weeks, uh, the fact that we've been able to put artifacts around the printer. Um, did that give rise to any further thoughts on your part about the project and what you had taken on? Um, in terms of what, what should happen next, I suppose, in some ways, um, yeah, definitely. But I, I would have thought that the minute I walked into the print room, uh, the day Billy allowed us up uh, to take the photographs and consider what we'd shoot and, you know, how, do we, how would we represent this? Because all film is only a representation, but... Um, yeah, I'm. I'm interested in heritage. I'm. I'm. Lord, to call myself a historian, but I suppose yeah, another one of those words you have to put yourself into as an historian, published historian. I suppose you'd have to say that I am always keen about um, heritage. The, the, the term heritage means what you inherit from the past, um, and that's tomorrow, right? What we inherit from today. Uh, it's not. It's not always the. You know the kind of perceived idea of heritage has been very old. It's, it's every day, it's, it's a living heritage. And immediately when I saw the artifacts in the print room, um, the first thing I thought, and it's one of the reasons I asked Billy, and you heard Billy saying that he, it, it hadn't kind of crossed his mind, and I, I, I don't mean to speak for Billy, but when I asked him, it's because that did strike me, uh, that this, these artifacts, this living heritage, that it is at the moment, um, it desperately needs to be preserved. Yeah. In fact, it's true to say that we've lost a lot of our our treasures, really, in Yall, haven't we, over the last decades? Yeah, a, a lot of it has gone to city centres, like um, the Horrigan Collection um, in the IFI in Dublin. 
um, and Watson stained glass, of course, the yaw lace, um, the artisan work from the carpets, uh, yaw carpets. Um, I, I, you can't really blame people for this because the people who are the people who mind this heritage are often families. I mean, like the carpet factory is, is, is you know, is, is a company, but people who own own this material, like Billy himself, it's not his responsibility to say, you know, I, I you know, I want this to happen with it. It's up to a community to say that this is our heritage, or up to a county, or up to a nation, or up to a people, or up to whoever, to say that the preservation of heritage is so crucial in my mind, because if you know your past, then you have some idea of, you know, how you might move forward. You, you, can't, you, can't, educate, you can't educate yourself tomorrow. Uh, you can't even educate yourself today because you're too busy living today. So you've got to educate yourself from what's come before. And if you don't preserve that, you, don't, you have very little chance of, of doing that. Yeah. I'd be very interested to hear if anybody has any reactions or questions for Michael. Uh, Robert you, you, is around somewhere with a roving mic. Um, anybody? Yeah, this lady in the, down here, Cayman. Just let the mic get to you. It's just easier. Thank you. Um, congratulations to you and Kieran for such a beautiful film. Thank you. Um, I just wondered, because we know each other, and I wondered yep. whether uh, you could talk a little bit about the uh, cinematic influences on this particular film, because it is very different from the other two films that you've made. Yeah. And I was really, I found it really moving, very evocative, very enigmatic. So it kind of reminded me of Bresson a bit. I wondered whether. Of who? Bresson, Robert Bresson. Okay. Um, but I wondered whether you wanted to elaborate on that. Um, yeah. Um, Gwenda is a former lecturer of mine in, in UCC film studies and a big influence um, on, on this work because... You particular. mentioned some of your own influences to me, yes. So maybe you yeah, talk a little um, bit about that. Uh, well, uh, having gone, gone, had done film studies with Gwenda in UCC, um, I was exposed to some incredible stuff that taught taught me all all these all these things that just seemed to just seemed to connect just all this stuff suddenly made sense when i sat down and watched these documentaries that i saw in ucc it just it just all made sense it was like where have i been all my life that i didn't see these things but jan vigo mm -hmm. is is a big influence to me agnes varda who's a french uh, new wave filmmaker uh, jan vigo's uh, propos denise in particular um it's just like I just want to make every film like that from now on, but I couldn't possibly make a film like that. But okay, they, they're so to answer Gwenda's question, yeah, just that, just that looking, just that looking without hitting people over the head with anything. That yeah, enigma. That trying to reach that enigma, Jan Vigo would definitely be that. And of that course, type of thing. Kieran as the cinematographer is in the mix with all this stuff. So I imagine you two. Uh, do quite a lot of talking, thinking together about We how do a lot of laughing as well. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't laugh as hard anywhere else when <laughs> we're in post-production. I don't know what it is, but... Um, and I think that's the secret to the success. We just don't take this too seriously. Yeah. You know, I, I, know I, I feel slightly embarrassed to kind of talking about film in, in a way that, because it's so populist and yet it's so artistic, you could go either way with this. Oh, well, uh, you're in the right place. We're in the right place, yeah. Um, Okay, yeah, yeah I, th I think it's a good working relationship um, because this is this is one art form where, like, if you if if you can leave the ego out of it, it can be hugely rewarding. Uh, Karen will often say it's not working, Mick, and I'll say, well, wait a while, and he'll say it's not working, and I'll say, just try this, and he'll say it's not working, and I'll go, okay, it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> so, or I will say, no, it must stay in, this must stay in, and he'll say, okay. You know, and then we'll wait, and then we might watch it back, and it works. But a lot of the post-production work, that's when you're putting the film together, is completely different then to the plan, the original plan. Um, and Kieran's come up with some very creative stuff. Um, in Another Way Home, I, I did a presentation the other night about documentaries for the Auburn Society in Newall, and uh, one of the clips I showed was Another Way Home when uh, the lady who was running the house um, broke down during the interview. Uh, because she was ex telling the story about the first lady who stayed in the in the house who had taken her own life, and we intercutted with old video footage, and uh, Karen came up with this great idea of intercutting, and um, it was one. It's one. Of, it's my favourite part of the film. Mm. 
um, and, and that was his idea, yeah. So it, I think, it, yeah, we're very relaxed about it, and I, I think that that's probably the key to the fact that that, that it works. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, yeah. Vera, down left. Uh, congratulations on a fabulously beautiful film. Thank you. Um, while there's so much living memory still of the crafts in y'all, wouldn't it be wonderful if a project could be put together, you know, with a film board or something, to document things like, say, the Watsons or uh, uh, y'all carpets? You know, it's, it's only about 10 years away from losing all of that. So um, the, we, an, encyc an encyclopedic approach wouldn't be... Okay. Inappropriate. Yeah. Um, Can I just uh, explain that that Vera, uh, that's Vera. I hope you won't mind me saying, but Vera curated the Watsons exhibition in the Crawford okay. in 2015. I don't know if anybody saw it, but it was a truly extraordinary, um, a really wonderful and quite breathtaking uh, uh, exhibition. Uh, thanks for your question, Vera. Um, yeah. Uh, I'd love to. I'd love to see the film housed somewhere permanent, you know, because um, so much of so much of film becomes disposable. So much of art, like film, film in particular, is kind of easy come, easy go. One day, you know, yesterday's news, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but it is a document uh, rather than a documentary, um, and I'd like to see it preserved somewhere in you where you know people in the future could watch it. I mean. Um, there should be something like that with all the artisan work or all the in, uh, uh, an industrial history yeah um should be housed in you all in one space um there's 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 a huge drive in you all at the moment about about heritage becoming the singular identity for you all for tourism um and i teach tourism and uh that's not why I. That's not why I think there should be. Um, I'm not even thinking about how many tourists it would bring in. I'm just thinking about the fact that it it is our heritage. Um, it should be celebrated. And as I said earlier, if you if you know where you've come from, you know where you're going. Um, and a lot of the stuff that you all people created, uh, th there is a huge sense of pride in in the fact that these kind of skills were coming from there. As they are in many towns. Uh, all the towns should have something like this. I'm sure there are other towns I can't remember, I can't think of or know what they do, but all of those towns should have something like that. Um, yeah, decentralised cultural, uh, decentralised culture, yeah. I suppose you could say that. Decentralise it and, and make the people curate their own work and present it, yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Congratulations um, you. on your piece of work. I'm um, from Yall myself, so my question would be: Is is there any plan for it to be shown in Yall? Oh, <laughs> I've heard you speak about this before, so I'm just wondering: Is there any update uh, as to yeah, any plans to put it on Yall? Well, well, uh, Tony has had, Tony has submitted a proposal to Cork County Council. Um, well, Michael Michael made me responsible for for this. Um, thanks very much. You're welcome. <coughs> You're welcome. Um, and we've I've had enough run in with people in Yall. <laughs> We've, we have put in a submission to Cork County Council. We haven't heard anything back yet. Uh, but I was asked about this on, on your radio this morning in um, uh, a frank uh, interview with uh, Noel Cronin, the gay burn of your radio. <laughs> and Noel asked me, well, you know, what are you going to do about it? So we have made a submission. We haven't heard back. But And the submission... Uh, points out that in order to do it to the standard we'd like, it's going to cost them, um, particularly because putting on something like a film and an exhibition, I think the two kind of do really go together. I know I'm speaking for myself, but I do think the exhibition does really give a kind of another dimension to, to, the, to the project. Um, so we're hopeful that they'll, they'll come back with a yes, but, you know, if they don't, we're going to do it anyway. So it will be a case of finding a space to show the, the film, talking to Bill uh, about that and um, about the artefacts and so on. Uh, and we'll make it happen somehow, um, regardless, or as they'd say, some people I know down in Yalta, irregardless. 
of what the, <laughs> the county council say. <laughs> because as Flann O'Brien said, the lock, stock and barrel of it all is the county council. Yeah, I, 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 I'd certainly like to see it, um, Sean. Um, because a lot of people who, who can't make it up or uh, because it's appropriate for it to be shown there, you know, and I'm kind of saying that off the quip now, I'm not really sure if I, if I mean that or not, but um, it, it, it is, I suppose, made in y'all and all that. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not too much into um, identity that way. I'm a very loose, fluid person in terms of geographics and identity and all that. Uh, but yeah, for, for people in Yola, I'd like them to see it and experience it, yeah. Uh, we have a real problem that we, we have an art centre that isn't an art centre, it's a performance centre. In other words, that you can, you can perform music there and you can perform plays and cinema, but you can't hang a nail or you can't hang a picture or, you know, and arts is so wide, uh, so broad a spectrum that they should change the name to the Performance Centre um, because it's, it's a misleading title. Uh, built out of public money, that's your money and my money. Um, and it's a real shame that we don't have a centre where all arts can, can be celebrated or encouraged. Uh, that, that's probably the biggest thing Tony said about the film being parallel with uh, the exhibition. You know, for me, for me, and for Kieran as well, and I don't want to speak for him, but I, I know he feels this way, that having the film here for six weeks, and they're on seven weeks, and having like a thousand people view it, I mean, you know, that's just unbelievable for us, because a film festival doesn't do that, and TV certainly can't do that. Uh, and this type of thing isn't shown on TV anyway, so... Um, it, it, it's, it film is wired like that because it, it can go different places. And being in the exhibition has, has been a huge help to the film, but likewise, it's been a big help to the artifacts as well. Yeah. They seem, seem to come together really well. And having a film like for almost seven weeks on public display, on a loop, you, know, you, couldn't, you couldn't dream that stuff up. Okay, any, any other questions, queries, comments, reactions? Gentleman down here on the right. Thanks, Cayman. Um, I'd just like to say congratulations to, Thank you. to Michael and to Kieran, and of course to the star of the show, Bill Field, sitting over there. I think it's a very, very timely intervention in y'all's heritage. Um, I suppose uh, uh, Michael and myself soldiered together uh, going to the Christian Brothers those many years ago. And I, I know personally that my I suppose love and uh, of history in y'all. Uh, you know, one of the things grow, growing up was the handbook for y'all and uh, um, the other publications that were that were done in fields printers all those years ago. And I think it's very very important um, to to see uh, this documentary being made. I think it's absolutely brilliant. Thank Congratulations you. again. Thank you, John. Um, Thanks, yeah. Uh, one of the things that isn't covered in the film, of course, is many of the works that. Fields have produced over years, particularly the handbook of you all, which it was it was the it was the one book, wasn't it, that everybody uh, learnt about their history. Um, I'd have a lot of issues with that book <laughs> on, a, on a different yeah. on a different level. Uh, but that that's that's a, that's an argument about history. Um, but as an artifact, yeah. Uh, and it, you know, as a child walking by, and it was just sitting there in the window. You know what I mean? And everybody seemed to have one. Every house you went to, it had one. Uh, how many places can actually say that? You know, but how many towns do you go to where there's, there's a, a print shop with the history of their town going back hundreds of years in a booklet sitting in the window for everybody to, to be able to, to read? Um, very few, if any, I would argue. And the only history book I know that uh, records two Fata Morganas taking place in the town. <laughs> These were highly fashionable things back in the Victorian era. They were like mirages or visions and both of them appeared across um across the, the just at the mouth of the black water uh, if you know y'all there's a there's a hill over there two fata Morgan, morganas sometime i think in the 1870s okay so there you are <laughs> any other questions anybody no i i would need to wrap it up shortly but what's next for complete control films what projects have you in the pipeline oh, oh um we're working on the red baron ballroom documentary at the moment oh, so it's just uh, it's just a hoot really uh it's there's so much nostalgia in this i feel like i'm 
going through a ploughed field with no shoes on, just like <laughs> so much nostalgia and sentimentality. Uh, it's just dripping with it, and it's just, it's just had a f it's just had a kind of phenomenal response um, from people. Um, so it's it, it is it is what it is. Uh, it's a nostalgia piece, really. It's nothing like this at all. It's just another direction again, and you know, um, but a, a, a cultural beast. Uh, Red Baron Ballroom documentary, uh, all about all about the. the Fifties and sixties, and, and a phenomenon in Ireland, really, where you know you get three thousand people in one little hall with no bar. Just you know, think of it now. Today, it's you know, if you if you said to a young person, oh, the, you know, there'll be a hall which is freezing, um, has a beautiful floor, and that's it, and a roof, um, no bar, and there'll be three thousand people in there, uh, and all the girls will sit on one side, and all the boys will sit on the other. Uh, we did an interview with a guy, a musician, and he said it was like a shoal of fish. <laughs> Just across the floor, um, Good and of course, times, huh? yeah, yeah, and of course, you could be refused ten times, but it didn't matter because there was just so much, so many people to choose from. Um, so that documentary is we're, we're just out of post production on that. Um, we also plan to do a documentary on the Horrigans, which will be, I hope, uh, if it happens, will be an extension of the printer, um, and it will be. The idea is for this to be very artistic because the Horrigans themselves are so artistic, and this is this is going to be a real challenge for me for the first time in a way of going into an area that's all new in terms of the artistic intent, um, animation, and uh, the Horrigans, of way. course, were filmmakers. And yeah, yeah, I should say that maybe the Horrigans are filmmakers in the old day. Kind of, I think they started taking photography in the 1890s, mm -hmm. and then progressed into film in the early 1900s, and then built the Horrigans Cinema uh, on South Main Street. You all had two cinemas in 1914. It had the Regal on one side of the street, and the Horrigan Picture Palace on the other side of the street. Imagine in 1914, two cinemas. Um, and people far and wide would cycle in in their best clothes. And they also did the Magic Lantern traveling show. They, they took the Mag Magic Lantern traveling show and how they carry that camera on bikes is just, it's extraordinary mm. when you think about the determination and they, they travel to local areas to show cinema and that must have been extraordinary for people at the time. So that's, that's the next documentary <laughs> that we hope to do after that. Um, and I'm also speaking to the National Sculpture Factory in Cork. Um, I think that's a beautiful place and there's beautiful work in there and artists. And I'd love to do another printer style film in the National Sculpture Factory. Interesting. Busy, busy, busy. Good. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Michael and thank Kieran. You, uh, I'd like to say thanks to everybody who uh, helped put together uh, this amazing project. It really was for us uh, a joy and for me especially because I suppose uh, as a Yall native, I had a personal interest in this. Um, so to everybody at Triscoll, thank you. Um, Bill, thank you very much. It uh, was your kindness and generosity that led us all in to the shop. Uh, unforgettable. Thank you all. Thank you.